Jesus said that, uh, he says, my words are spirit and they're life. And there's an impartation happening as the preaching of the word goes on. There's life being imparted to us. There's faith being imparted. But it only happens if we stay attentive to his word. So let me just pray as we commit our time to the Lord and trust God to speak to us again this morning. Father, we once again, Lord, as we approach this time of the, the reading and the proclamation of the scriptures, the teaching of the word, we want to thank you, Father, ahead of time, Lord, that uh, faith comes understanding comes, solutions, uh, Lord, are being given to us, Lord, during this time, answers to challenges, to problems that we are facing, areas, Lord, where our lives might be confused. We thank you, Lord God, that there is a, 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 an ordering uh, happening uh, over chaos and over confusion. And we thank you, Father, that, Lord, as our lives are laid bare before you uh, still at this time, Lord God, that, uh, Lord, that your word will point out faults, it'll point out errors and 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 it'll point out deceptions and 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 lord it'll bring us into a level of truth um it equip us and uh, we want to thank you for these things in jesus name amen the series uh of messages that we're ministering on at the moment is entitled the choice of sowing and the joy of reaping and uh this is uh, the sixth um session, if you like, that we are ministering on that subject, and it could be the last one. We'll see how we go. But so far, we have said that the title of the message is that there's a choice of sowing. We can choose to sow. Uh, we can choose not to sow. We can choose to sow the right kinds of seeds. We can choose the, ro the wrong kinds of seeds. Um, every action, every word we speak, every attitude that we hold in our heart is really a seed. Um, and uh, depending on the types of seeds that we sow, there will be the joy of reaping. For some people, it's not a joy of reaping. It is a disaster of reaping because they've sown disaster disastrous seeds, so they're reaping a disastrous harvest. We can choose. Um, and sometimes, you know, typically when we come to the Lord and our lives are not all that good, um, because typically, you know, we live life according to our own philosophy and our own um, sort of, uh, rules and regulations rather than according to the way that God wants us to live our lives. Then sometimes it takes a little while to bring everything into order, but uh, week after week or day after day as we're in the Word, uh, God's Word corrects us, God's Word points out the areas where we are wayward. Uh, we might think we're doing perfectly okay, but certainly the Word of God points out, look, this is actually not right. God wants you say, God says, I want you to live like this. And, and that's what the preaching of the Word does to us. And so there's the joy of reaping. And I want to again pick up on our theme scripture here from Galatians chapter 6, verse 7. And by now we'd almost know it off by heart because we've read it for so, for so often. It says, don't be under any illusion. You cannot make a fool of God. A man's harvest in life depends entirely on what he sows. If he sows for his own lower nature, his harvest will be the decay and death of his own nature. But if he sows for the Spirit, he will reap uh, the harvest of everlasting life by that Spirit. Let us not grow tired of doing good. Uh, so evidently doing good is sowing the right kinds of seeds. Let us not grow tired in doing good. For unless we throw in our hand, the ultimate harvest is assured. Let us then do good to all men as opportunity offers, especially to those who belong to the household of faith. Uh, very briefly, I want to recap on what we've already said so far, and particularly last Sunday, we talked about sowing the Word of God and so forth. We ran out of time, and I want to pick up on that and continue on from there and hopefully bring things to, to, a, to a conclusion so that we can all understand what um, the plan and the purpose of God is regarding that. We've said that the quality of our life today uh, is really the result of the seeds that we've sown yesterday. And when we, we talk about seeds, we don't mean as in physical seeds, such as carrot seed and pumpkin seeds and so forth. But every word, every action, every attitude is a seed. Um, each response to somebody in any given situation is in a sense a seed. It'll either give me a good harvest or it'll give me a bad harvest. Um, so that's why we don't speak our mind, because if I speak my mind, I've got problems, because there's stuff going on in my mind at various times that is just way, way off. Um, and uh, so I need to bring my mind back in again. Uh, and and uh, the Bible says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Uh, I control the words uh, that I speak so that there's only good words, good seeds that come out of my mouth. I control my actions towards others, um, whether I initiate the actions or whether they're initiated as a response to somebody else's actions. I control all of that because I want a good harvest in my life 
continuously. Um, and so that's what we said. We said that uh, the principle of sowing and reaping is fundamental in God's kingdom, and actually it works all the time. You can't, ne- you can't never turn it off. Um, you know, like it's just, it's never turned off. The, the, that law, that principle works all the time. It works for good or for bad. And uh, once we know about it, we can be very purposeful in sowing good seeds. Um, now, last week we talked about that the Word of God is incorruptible seed. Um, and uh, Jesus speaking to an agricultural uh, society. Uh, we are not that today. We are, you know, it's a modern society. Most people haven't got a, a garden of their own. Hardly anybody does farming these days. Uh, and so it's almost like we've got to reteach uh, some of these principles so we understand the principles of God uh, that he's trying to get across to us. Uh, Jesus using agricultural terms to convey to us a spiritual truth in regards to how to function in God's kingdom and how to be able to receive those things that he's prepared for us because Jesus paid for it. Jesus paid for everything on the cross. It's all paid for. Uh, that's why we get excited in his presence and or just January we get excited because he's already paid for it. Uh, Jesus doesn't have to pay for my healing anymore. It's already paid for. All I need to do is receive. Jesus has already paid for peace in my heart. He's, it's already taken care of. All I have to do is receive. Um, and for some of these things, I've got to order my life right so that I can live in peace rather than in turmoil and in chaos. Sometimes uh, people's chaos is purely the result of their own, their own wrong choices and their own wrong actions. That's why we teach the Word so that we know how to, how to choose the right thing in every given situation. Um, in Luke chapter 8... Jesus uh, taught the parable of the sower and then explained it. We read it last week. I won't do it again today, but quickly by way of refresher, uh, we found out that uh, the seed is the word of God or the word of God is the seed. Uh, Seeds are being sown right now, by the way. As I speak the word of God, seeds are being sown right now. Um, And the heart of man or the heart of people is the soil. The heart is the field. The heart is the ground. And we don't mean our heart is in our physical pump, the blood pumps blood around uh, our body, but we talk about the eternal part of us, our spirit and our soul connect, connected together. The Bible calls that the heart, and the Word of God is sown uh, into the heart, or at least that's the intention. Um, and we say that there's four different conditions of soil represented in the hearts, uh, in, in the lives of those. So let me start again. There's four different Conditions of soil represented in those who hear the word. And here they are, the four. The one's called the wayside soil. Uh, That represents hard, unplowed ground. When somebody hears the word and it just kind of uh, sits on the surface, it doesn't penetrate into the soil because the soil has not been plowed over uh, and prepared uh, and so forth. Then uh, the Bible says that, you know, birds come and eat the the seed and and, and the seed's gone again. And that's reference of the devil coming to steal the word. Um, When we hear the word, we've got to like hold on to it. Otherwise, the devil comes and we can walk out the door. In here, we're really excited, walk out the door and the word's gone because the devil doesn't wait for a harvest to happen. He will just come and swoop in and through strife and stuff going on and and stresses and pressures and worries and everything where it's gone again. Uh, So we hold on to the word. Number two, there's a rocky soil. The rocky soil represents soil that has been on the surface, been prepared. It's been kind of dug over a little bit, but not deep enough. So the word in people's lives springs up, it begins to germinate and begins to grow, but when the pressures of life come on, uh, because they haven't got any depth in themselves, there's rocks buried underneath that soil, Uh, then, uh, you know, because of the heat uh, and and perhaps drought conditions or what have you, then the whole thing dies again, it brings nothing to fruition. The third type of soil is the the thorny ground. Uh, Remember that in the the rocky soil, the problem is underneath the soil. On On the thorny ground, the problem is on top of the soil. There's all the cares, all the worries, uh, deceitfulness of riches, lusts of other things, just all crowding in. There's all of this stuff going on. Uh, and when the word is sown, people in the middle of it all can't hardly receive it because they're so filled with care and so filled with worry. And they're so filled with wanting to get this and wanting to do that and, and wanting to do the other. A lot of things that don't even connect them with the destiny of God. But sometimes just activity for activity's sake, and we've got to just clear the deck and uh, 
clear the ground for the word of God to be sown, to bring fruition. And then we talk about the good ground. Uh, Jesus says that the good ground is those with a good and an honest heart bring forth fruit, some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. And this is, this is like teaching today, guys. So, you know, teaching requires, it demands attention from us that we connect in and follow the train of thought because God wants to get something across to us. Um, and so good ground refers to the heart of a person that's been prepared for spiritual growth and for productivity by being plowed over uh, and cleared of all the obstacles, both above as well as below the ground. What's above the ground? All the worries, all the cares of this world, all the stuff that crowds in has been cleared out the way. And you know, when we become Christians, most people are typically busy. And you know, we gotta, we got to just, rather than just add yet one other uh, type of activity, which is Sunday activity, church activity, into our already crowded life, we've got to offload some of these things. And uh, sometimes people are overly, you know, I'm all for sports and for hobbies and recreation, I'm all for that. But sometimes people are so overburdened with a lot of this stuff, they've got no room for God. And so we've got to clear the deck, everything that's above the ground clear it away the cares the worries deceitfulness of riches uh, thinking that we got to even while while you know like even uh, have, sometimes haven't got time for church because we've got to pursue money making activities and and haven't got time for connect group because we're pursuing money making activities and you know everybody's got to make money you got to live but everything has its proper place um Everything is above the ground, clear it away. Then everything that's below the ground, we talked about it last week, attitudes, mindsets, uh, uh, offenses towards people, uh, unforgiveness. Uh, it's buried underneath the ground. You can't see it. You can see somebody when somebody's worried overly, you know, like that's it's visible. But sometimes there's stuff going on underneath people's lives and uh, and everything. It needs to be it needs to be dug up and cleared away just the same. Uh, just before we pray for lost people, uh, as we typically do every Sunday, that's that's uh, that's in a sense plowing the ground. Uh, the Spirit of God goes and rains uh, the water of His Spirit on 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 people's lives so that they're becoming open to receptive to the to the to the to the word of God when they hear the word when they hear the gospel so there's a variety of ways of, of plowing the ground uh, today I really want to focus on on the whole aspect of the, the the word of God being the seed a lot of Christians don't know what we're talking about here today um, and that is borne out by them taking such a flippant approach to uh, the time when the preaching of the Word goes on, or um, don't make a big effort to read the Word of God and to feed their spirit on God's Word and, and so forth. I want to pick up in Isaiah chapter 55, verse 10 and verse 11, where it says that the rain and the snow fall from the sky um, and do not return, but instead water the earth and make it produce and yield crops. Everybody say produce and yield crops. All right, so this is a natural picture here of agricultural principles that when rain happens, because uh, in, dr in drought conditions nothing much grows, but in rainy, uh, you know, the, the rain comes to water the earth and so forth and make it produce and yield crops. So God wants us to produce and uh, to, 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 as it were, produce and yield crops spiritually. Uh, he says, and provide seed for the planter and food for those who must eat. In the same way, everybody say in the same way, God's just given us a natural picture here of uh, agricultural principles of uh, seed being sown and rain coming down and producing and those plants that are being produced have got seeds in themselves who produce more and with more rain and so forth. You get a continual harvest coming through. He says, in the same way, he says, the promise that I make does not return to me having accomplished nothing. No, he says, it is realized as I desire and is fulfilled as I intend. And so he says, in the same way as all of this stuff goes on in the realm of this, in the natural realm, but seed and, and, and ground and, and, and water and snow and the snow melts and waters uh, the, the plains and so forth, he says, in the same way, he says, uh, the promise that I make does not return to me. So that tells us immediately that God's word is going to return to him one day. Uh, God's word is going to return. He's spoken it, he's sent it out, and it is going to return to him one day. But he says, it's not going to return to me without having accomplished anything. God wants the word to accomplish something. God has, has, uh, uh, has uh, um, injected his word with power as it's gone forth out of his mouth 
is recorded for us in Bibles and in CD recordings and in DVD recordings and whichever medium that the Word happens when it is sown into our heart, it, it has got power within itself to bring itself to pass. There is inherent power in the Word of God. And the, the Word of God is pregnant with the power of God. Um, every word is, if you like, a little container, a little capsule that has the power of God on the inside. In the same way as every seed that you, you can sow in, you take corn, for example, that corn is a container and it's got the power in, it, in itself to bring itself to pass or to reproduce itself. And so when you sow that into your backyard and you prepare the ground and everything, that corn's going to bring forth a corn plant and it'll produce and then you can eat and enjoy the harvest. And so each word that God has spoken, if it's sown into our heart and we clear the ground and we, 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 we do the things that he's told us to do in order to make the soil fertile, the word of God will look after itself and it'll, it's sown into our lives and then it'll bring bring forth, and it'll produce after itself. What does that mean? Well, the promise, God says, whatever the promise promises, that's what the Word's going to produce. And I'm not trying to disconnect God from His Word or His Word from God, because the Bible says God and His Word are one. And you know the power of God is, we lay a hold of the power of God by laying a hold of His Word. The promise that I make does not return to me having accomplished nothing. He says, no, he says, it is realized as I desire. What does God desire when words of salvation are spoken? God wants those words of salvation to be lodged in the heart of men and to bring forth salvation in their lives. When God speaks healing words, then those healing words, he wants them to lodge in the hearts of people that uh, have got sickness in their body, and God wants to bring forth healing in their lives. So how do I lay a hold of healing? By laying a hold of the promises for healing. And the healing scriptures have got the power of God locked up within itself. When I take that seed of the word and sow it into my heart, it will bring forth healing. And of course the trick is to not wait until somebody is sick before we give them the word. The trick is to have healing scriptures in our lives all the time that don't have to heal us but keep us healthy. That's part of the trick. So God speaks his word in terms of agricultural principles, sowing and reaping, growth and productivity. And if I constantly sow, and I'm reading from the outline now, if I constantly sow the promise of God into the soil of my heart, I will reap whatever the promise promises. I will reap whatever the promise promises. So if I have a particular need in my life, and I search the Scriptures to find the right kinds of seed, for that particular need. And then take that scripture and sow that into my heart consistently. I can expect the power of God to be released in this area of my life. And healing scriptures will bring forth healing. Prosperity scriptures will bring forth prosperity. Peace scriptures will bring forth peace. Salvation scriptures will bring forth salvation. And uh, all of these other things. Uh, and, you know, faith will rise in my heart. And sometimes uh, people all all concerned and all all concerned about end times. End time scriptures will mean if they're if they're taught right will bring peace into our lives regarding the future rather than fear and trepidation. So all of these things are seeds to be sown into the soil of our heart so that in time, everybody say in time. This is not an overnight sort of a deal now. Most certainly somebody can receive a miracle or healing in their lives through the gifts of the Spirit. But we're talking now the principle of sowing and reaping is slightly different. Gifts of the Spirit, instant stuff goes on. But we're talking about living a lifestyle of being in the Word, sowing seeds and reaping harvest, sowing seeds and reaping harvest. Some of that takes a while. The Bible speaks of the, of the, the principle of seed time and harvest. 
cold and heat, summer and winter. God says it will not change. It will continue on and continue on and continue on. But he says seed, time, and harvest. And we have said, you know, the seed time, in other words, typically either in springtime that seeds are sown. And I remember when I grew up on the farm back on my parents' farm there, some seeds are sown in autumn, and they're out there in the field during the winter time, covered by snow. Springtime, when the snow melts and the ground is nice and moist and the sun, the heat gets on, there suddenly those seeds spring forth. They were sitting there all, all winter long uh, and not doing anything. They're just sitting there waiting. And, uh, you know, even like what we did today, that sometimes, you know, we have to work, but sometimes uh, it's like the heat of the presence of God getting on it, and suddenly something begins to germinate, and suddenly something begins to happen that uh, hasn't happened for a while, because we need to be in the presence of God. Uh, that's where the, the, the sun of, of righteousness shines on us, and praise God, so germination comes, and in a place like standing here with our eyes closed, suddenly revelation begins to happen, and suddenly there's an opening of the eyes of understanding, and suddenly, well, he, he here it goes, here it goes. You see, we've said that that uh, understanding the word is the germination of the seed. If I don't understand the word, the seed will not germinate in my life. Uh, and, and so whatever I'm, that's why we are teaching church. We don't just throw scriptures around. We teach the word so that people have understanding because that is the starting point of a harvest to come into our lives. Each seed brings forth according to its own kind. If you dig over your backyard and hopefully you got uh, good soil there rather than just clay, which is what, the, what is the case in most situations, and of course there's things you can do to turn that into, into good soil, and you go out to the supermarket or to the gardening shop and buy yourself some carrot seeds and, uh, and put the seeds out there and you know just make sure that the, the whole thing is watered and the sun gets on it. You don't find a shady spot. You find a sunny spot and everything. You know, In due time, you will reap, you will reap carrots because you've sown carrot seeds you'll reap a, a, a harvest of carrots. It's not going to happen that you go out there and sow carrot seeds and then you go inside and you water, and you go back inside again another day, another night, and suddenly something comes up and says, what is that? Oh no, I'm getting pumpkins coming up. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Whatever seed you sow, that's the harvest that you're going to get. And that is the very thing that God is trying to get, to, get across to us. Whatever seeds you sow, that's the harvest that you're going to get. Genesis 1, verse 11, the account of creation. God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit trees that, uh, that yields fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And so it was. And the earth brought forth grass, the, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, the herb... The plant that yields yield seed according to its own kind. You see, a carrot is not going to yield pumpkin seeds. A carrot is going, a carrot plant is going to yield carrot seeds. So when you plant them, you get more carrots. And and the tree whose uh, yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. I love that. I love that. That is such a cool picture there. That in regards to the tree that produces fruit and it's got the seed in itself. And, uh, and so in the Word of God, there's the seeds. In, inside the Word of God is the seeds for another harvest uh, as we plant that into our heart. And, you know, th there's, there's faith locked up in the Word. As I sow that Word in my heart, faith rises in my heart. How did it happen? Faith comes by hearing, Romans chapter 10, uh, verse 10 tells us. How does faith come? It comes by hearing. And so in these little containers called the Word of God, and, and you know, we teach uh, words, sentences, verses, concepts, and so forth. And, and as that is thrown out there, and those that lay a hold of it and receive the Word, it, it brings faith, it brings hope, it brings understanding. And if we keep the Word, we're bringing forth uh, fruit with patience some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. And if you feel that you might be locked into the 30 fold, you don't have to stay there. You can increase to 60 and to 100 fold. People are not locked into a higher, lower level. It's something that, that, you know, we grow in the purposes of God and we grow in our ability to produce fruit. And, you know, sometimes there's different seasons and sometimes we go through a season of where there's not much visible stuff going on. But, you know, the same is true in, in, in uh, 
in, 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 in life, in the natural life, when, you know, the trees go through different cycles, there is springtime, then leaves appear, and then, and then, and then flowers, and then fruit, and, and then the fruit are ripen, and then come towards the end of summer and, and autumn, then you harvest the fruit, and then it, the tree loses its leaves, and we need to recognize their seasons, even, even in the realm of the Spirit. And, and you know, sometimes we sort of almost, there's something like internal frustrations going on, and I, I don't know how a tree feels in wintertime, but I'm, I could imagine if it, if it had thought it could probably feel a bit frustrated. I mean, um, there's not much going on right now, but there's internal work going on, being reworked and attitudes readjusted and everything, preparing for fruitfulness again. So if right now, right now, there's not a whole lot of stuff going on, be encouraged and uh, don't grow weary in doing well. For in due season, Galatians tells us, you will reap if you don't faint. It is in those seasons that sometimes people give up and say, oh, it's not working and walk away as it were. And God says, no, don't grow weary in doing well. You will reap. You will reap. So every plant brought forth seeds after its own kind, which in turn brought forth fruit after its kind. Carrots will always produce carrots. Pumpkin will always produce pumpkin. A grain uh, uh, like wheat will always produce wheat. Uh, that's, that's how it works. And healing scriptures will always produce healing. And prosperity scriptures will always uh, produce prosperity. And sadly, sadly, the prosperity message has not been received too well in all quarters. It's a bit like feeding kids. You know, sometimes you put something in there and then the next day you think, I'm going to introduce a new type of food, uh, a new type of food. And, you know, you don't just put carrot and, and put a bit of potato in there and sometimes maybe a little bit of meat and everything, mash it all up, fine, and feed them. And, you know, they, they feel something, and, you know, and then they spit it out. And sometimes, you know, you feed, you feed people with the word of God and say, God loves you. And they say, yes, amen. And God wants to heal you. Yes, amen. God wants to prosper you. They spit it out. You know, prosper, that's got to be of the devil. No, 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 no. Poverty is of the devil. Prosperity is of God. <laughs> what if I had a mirror and see what that looks like as I'm spitting this out? Probably looks silly. But you know, in the realm of the Spirit, that's what it looks like. God's trying to feed His people and they spit it out. I remember, um, some of you may remember, we had a man here from the States in the early days of our church by the name of Ken Lawrence. How do you remember Ken Lawrence? Some of you do. Wonderful man. Still around him and his wife, still doing stuff for God, which is absolutely fantastic. He says he had a vision one day. And in this vision, he says he saw that when the preaching of the Word went on, he says, uh, he says that there was, like, there was like food flying from the platform out there, spiritual food. It was like, you know, looked like, like food uh, that you would have on your plate when you have dinner. And he says some people had like a bib on and they had more, more food in the bib and in that little tray that catches all the food that they didn't eat rather than what went into their heart. And, and, and he says God showed him that some people really receive the word and others just don't receive it at all. And if people don't receive the word, you can't have a harvest of what the Word is trying to produce. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, For this reason we also constantly thank God that when you receive the Word which you hear from us, everybody say, receive the Word, which you hear from us, he says, you accepted it not as the Word of man, but for what it really is, the Word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. You know, we kind of t take a natural approach to this thing, listen to the preacher and say, I wonder where he gets that from. Oh, it's probably just, you know, it's just probably just got on the internet and got a few thoughts and a few things, and, and now it's just throwing that at us. Uh, no, 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 no. This is the Word of God. Uh, the, uh, let's recognize it for what it is. The Word of God, he says, for what it really is, the Word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. If you've got a, a pen in your hand, circle the word in you. Uh, the, the Word performs in you who believe. The Word doesn't per perform outside of you. It performs in you who believe. So to get the Word of God to perform its work in our lives, we've got to get the, we've got to get the Word on the inside of us. Because you see, the Word of God is designed for the hearts of men. And the hearts of men is designed for the Word of God. The Word doesn't work if it's not in the heart of men. And the heart of men doesn't work 
properly if it doesn't have the word in there. It'll have everything else in there. Thorns and thistles and unforgiveness and what have you. But if the word gets in there, it'll bring order, it'll bring stability. And in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 12, just so that we can have confidence that God is really committed to his word, he says, Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. In, in the previous chapter, in previous verses, I should say, first chapter, uh, the Bible says that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And it says that several times, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And he, like, received a burden from the Lord. He heard the word and he was burdened with that word. It was in regards to people and everything. And uh, God began to speak certain things that were going to happen in the future and uh, that needed to happen in the future and such like. And Jeremiah listened and he heard and he received the word. And God says, he says, I am watching over my word to perform it. To, perf to perform what? Whatever the word says. Whatever the promise promises, that's what the word is going to perform. So let's not be flippant with the word and let's not be casual when it comes to the preaching of the word or each time we open the book. Let's not be casual about, oh, I better do my reading for the day and you know just get my chapter out, out the way and everything. Let's approach it that this is actually the word for what it really is. This is the word of God, which is the power of God unto salvation to him who believes. Let's receive it. Let's mull over it. Let's meditate. Let's speak it. And, and, and let's uh, approach it uh, for what it really is. God says, I'm watching over it. God's here right now. He's watching the, 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 the order of service, the proceedings. God knows the preaching is going on right now. Of course he does. <laughs> <laughs> but God's watching. Because each word that is spoken, each verse that is read out, God's like right there with it. If you imagine the word flying along and God flying with it, wherever the word lands, God watches over that word to perform it. But you've got to receive it. You've got to lay a hold of it. And sometimes it strikes me as though, I've said it last week, it strikes me as though the people don't realize what's going on when the preaching of the word is going on. People are dawdling. People are doing all sorts of stuff. People are like daydreaming and in, a, in, in some space that they ought not to be in. And, uh, and uh, people are not really paying attention as they should. Uh, I, I, I don't mean here. I mean in other places. <laughs> my son, attend to my word. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20. My son, attend to my word. Incline your ear to my saying. Keep them in the midst of your heart. For my sayings, my word, they're life to those who find it and health and medicine to all their flesh. Please note, it says keep it in the midst of your heart. I know that in gardening, I haven't got a, a, a veggie garden or anything. I've got a couple of Things grow and the finesse is planted, but uh, but uh, I know that uh, from theory, all right. And if I'm wrong, please correct me. But from theory, I know that certain plants will grow well if you plant them against a, a stone wall somewhere in the back of the garden, or under some bit of shelter or under something. But but God says His work must be in the midst of the garden, not shoved to the edge somewhere. And people do that. I've said it last week that some people cling more to, the, to their culture than what they cling to the Word of God. I could say something wrong from, from the Word and some of you would not even be offended, even though you should be. But I can speak against your culture within five minutes so offend you because you're clinging to the wrong thing. It's whatever offends us. That's what's dear to us. Are we still doing all right this morning? <laughs> Have you gone home on me? got to receive the word. Let the word challenge your stupid culture. And let the word of God become your culture and your constitution. Mark chapter 4, verse 26, and he said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground 
and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the, the seed should sprout and grow, he himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, and then the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. The Bible tells us here the earth brings forth of itself. And your heart and my heart is designed that if we keep it clean and unobstructed, and the word of God is on it, it knows to bring forth. I don't have to strain to bring forth spiritual fruit in my life. If I get the conditions right and do everything that I'm, I'm supposed to be doing and not allowing worries and, and stuff to crowd in and unforgiveness to get in there or a root of bitterness to spring up, my heart will bring forth. You see, uh, a good heart, and Jesus says it's actually only the good heart. It's only a quarter of the, of the soil representation that is actually bringing forth. Only a quarter. Three quarters, not happening. The wayside, seed sown, they will come, steals the word, nothing happening. The uh, 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 stony ground, yes, uh, the word uh, uh, gets into the heart, but because there's not been any clearing away of the underneath stuff, it springs up, but then it produces nothing. Uh, soil number three, the thorny ground, nothing's produced because the word's never even had a chance to spring up. A good heart is one that has been plowed through repentance and further prepared through worship. Let me give you a key in regards to producing in your life. Worship is more important than what the people realize. I mean true worship to abandon ourselves in the presence of God in worship where we are more conscious of God than what we are of our own surroundings. Sadly, sometimes people have been Christians for years and years, they still don't know how to worship. They still are not entering in. The Bible says, enter his presence with thanksgiving. Come into his courts with praise. Oh, they might sing a couple of songs, a couple of lines, but there's no change. They're still as uh, stone cold as what they were when they came in, and they're walking out the same way. The Word hasn't done all the things that it's supposed to be doing. They haven't worshipped God. We, you see, there's a reason why we put worship ahead of the preaching of the Word. There's a reason for that. Because worship plows the ground of our heart and we are now, we've come in out of the world, there's been stuff going on, challenges and everything, and now, after we have worshipped God, we are ready to receive the word. There's reasons for that. And sometimes to the extent that we worship God in the, in the song service is the extent that we're able to receive in the preaching part of the service. Interesting thought. Psalm 107, verse 20. God sent his word and healed them, and delivered them from their destructions. Let me back up again, talking about a good heart. I just skimmed over that. I want to go back to it. Second point there, a good heart is one which has the rocks of selfishness and self-determination removed. And thirdly, it has the thorns of worries, deceitfulness of riches, and the pleasures of this life cleared away. And God sent his word. What's, what's God sent his word for? To give a harvest. Back to him and back to us. When we grow spiritually, that's God's harvest. When we receive our healing, that's God's harvest. God's thrilled with that. When we f f fall into the purposes of God in pursuing our God destiny rather than a fleshly destiny, that is our harvest and that's God's harvest. That's what God wants. But God has sent his word into the earth, but it will not prosper by just floating around in the atmosphere. It will only prosper and bring forth when it is lodged into our hearts that has been prepared to make room. So God has designed his word for the hearts of people and God has designed the hearts of people for his word. Your heart, my friend, and my heart, it's been designed to have the word of God in it and then it'll function at top, top capacity. And in Psalm 119, verse 130, it says, The entrance of God's word gives light it gives understanding to the simple. I, I remember the day when I was in a prayer meeting and I heard that verse for the first time. At that stage, I hadn't read through the Bible. If I had, quite possibly, I could have missed it. And I heard this word, and I, thought, I knew that that was a word. That wasn't just some, somebody, you know, I knew that was a word. And after the prayer meeting, I said, 
That word. Where is that? He says it's in Psalms. Don't know what verse, but he says it's in Psalms. And the entrance of God's word. And that word so struck me. And I knew, I knew, I knew that there was a key there that I had to get a hold of in order for me to be productive spiritually. The entrance of God's word. See, while, while the word floats around in the atmosphere, it's left, uh, it's left the mouth of God. Uh, uh, it's been recorded by men of old in the Bible, in scrolls, and nowadays in electronic format. It's been picked up by preachers. It is spoken into the atmosphere, but while it floats around in the atmosphere, it's it, it not going to do a thing until it enters into the heart of man. The entrance of God's word brings light. It's the entrance of it. And uh, looking at that word entrance, is almost like a dual, a, a dual a meaning in there. Uh, when we look at the original word, it speaks of the unfolding of the word brings light. And as we've said, that's why we teach, we, 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 un, we unfold the word, we unpack it. And uh, as Nehemiah did, and the priests, when they stood before the people there, and they erected some sort of a platform on which they rolled out the scroll, and, uh, and the priests read the word, and then they gave the sense. Nehemiah, I don't know what chapter and verse, but you can find it if you're interested in it. That, that really excites me. Like They read the word, and then they gave the sense. We read the word, and we gave the sense, so that people can understand it. And it is the unfolding of the word that is also the entrance of the word. If people don't understand the word, and sometimes through no fault of the, of the one preaching the word, it's sometimes because they're not making an effort. Their mind wanders. They, they're just distracted by everything that's going on. They're not, the, the word has not entered into their heart. But it's entered into the heart of the one that said, I'm going to lay a hold of something here today. Just very quickly as we... Um, begin to wind down. Let me give you some keys um, that cause the Word of God to perform its intended function in our lives. And some of those we've already talked about, but I, I just want to go over some of these things again. I just want to nail it. Everybody say, nail it. Let's nail it today. Because you see, I, I, uh, having, having passed it now for some 23, 23, 24 years, I mean, you see people that absolutely take off, like take off spiritually and within, come from, from, from out of a mess, get born again, get filled with the Spirit, plug into church life and, and get active and everything. And within a year to 80 months, they're, they're producing, they're producing. Their life's transformed, they're going somewhere, they're excited. And then sometimes people being Christian for year and year and year, still in the same place, still going around the same mountain, still complaining, the same complaints, singing the same old song, not a song of victory, but an old dirge about how bad life is, and still the same. Why, why is that? These ones receive the word, and these ones don't receive the word. And they, exp they, they explain why it couldn't work in their lives. Are we having fun this morning or what? You know, God... God tells us that when he, he, the Jewish people in the Jewish age, when that was going on, God talked about the Gentiles, the non-Jews, that you, you, you and I, uh, unless you, you're Jewish uh, background, you know, we, we are Gentile people. God says he was going to visit the Gentiles and raise them up to, to a certain extent to cause the Jews to provoke them to jealousy. And this is not a bad sort of a jealousy, but to stir them up and say, hey, we are the ones to whom the word came first, and now these guys are overtaking us. They're, they're enjoying all the goodness of God, and we're struggling over here. And sometimes God causes us to notice where so-and-so has only just been born again for, for three months, for goodness sake, and they're already going hard out, and, and others have been born again for ten years and still not going anywhere. <laughs> Number one, receive it eagerly. Acts 17, 11, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. When Paul and his traveling entourage went to Thessalonica, there was a, an uproar, there was like a, a, a riot. They said, we don't want to hear this. We, 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 not, we don't want to receive this. And Paul says, all right, let's go. 
And they went to this next place there, and they were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Because the, the people in Thessalonica, they argued against the word. But the people here in Berea, that's what the name of the township, Bereans. That's why you get, uh, that's why you get sometimes Christian bookshops called Berean, because that's, they received the word. You know, there's like a word picture in there. So they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily whether those things be so. If nothing that is said in the preaching of the word week after week ever provokes you to search the scriptures to see if these things are so and where's the full story? There was just a comment made, but where's the full story? If nothing ever provokes you to do that, can I recommend that you perhaps not as eager to receive the word is what God wants you to be. And I'm eyeballing you all now. <laughs> Every believer ought to be a student of the word. Every believer. Which brings me to point number two. Don't argue with it. James chapter 1 verse 21 says that they humbly accept the word planted in you which can save you. You see the word can do things. But it's not going to work until I receive it and plant it and keep it in my heart and through patience bring forth some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. And you know, sometimes people argue with the word. I found myself doing that, uh, particularly in the early days. I something said that I don't like and I argue with it in my mind. Sometimes people get really stroppy and they stand up and argue with the preacher, but you just don't do that. That's not a good thing to do. And, and so I'm, I'm sitting there and I go, no, oh, it's all right for him to say that. He doesn't understand my situation. I'm just arguing with it, arguing, arguing. How many of you know that the flesh likes to argue? If you're sitting there right now and you're arguing in your heart against the word that I'm preaching, you're in the flesh. <laughs> so sometimes people allow themselves to be critical of God's word instead of allowing the word to be critical of their thoughts. These people are judgmental of the word of God rather than letting it judge them and their thoughts. You know, in Hebrews chapter uh, uh, 4, verse 12, it says that the word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and of the intents of the heart. The word of God is a critic that points out faults, and along with it brings the answer to that particular situation in our lives. Most people understand computers nowadays. You know, you get the virus software um, that you load up on your PC or on your laptop um, and um, virus software so that viruses don't come in from the outside and affect our computer, mess things up or whatever these things are designed to do. Um, viruses, of course, are not just... Um, uh, arise out of themselves. They've been written by nasty people. And um, you know the devil is a nasty piece of work that designs viruses to inject them into people's lives, to throw them off course and to mess up their whole system. Lies and deception that is sold into people's hearts. But you know the Word of God? When it is ingested and, and when you load the Word of God onto the hard drive of your heart, when you run your virus software and you actually let it, let it run right through everything and you know you can check in regards to where you want it to go that you do the C drive and does any, any external hard drive if you plug that in and all of, the, all of these things uh, and, and, and the virus software just works it checks through every bit of data just every line and it all happens so fast and if it finds a virus it'll arrest it and, and uh, lock it up and put it into the virus fault where it can't do any more damage. The Word of God is designed to check through every line in our heart of concepts and ways of operating and methods of responding to certain situations and memories and just checks right through it. Right through it. And everything that is crooked, every crooked thought, it'll point it out. And... Uh, and what it wants to do is it wants to take that crooked thought, it wants to take that lie and put it into the virus fault. But if you argue with the word, God says, all right, you want to cling to the lie, you cling to the lie. 
You want to cling to your culture? You cling to your culture. But you want fruit. You've got to let the Word challenge every mindset, every imagination, every philosophy that we have bought into. And it checks right through it. Checks through patterns, strong thought patterns, strongholds, wrong motivations, exposes them and fixes them and straightens out our thinking. And when we've run our virus software and it's picked up a couple of viruses and arrested them, suddenly the whole system works better. When we allow the Word of God to, to check for a virus of unforgiveness, suddenly the system works better. Arrest that thing and chuck it into the, into the vault and say, I will not go there anymore. I will not harbor unforgiveness towards that person. And the same is true in every other... Uh, uh, the Word is truth, and it always points out the lie. Feed your spirit on God's word daily. Matthew 4, verse 4, man shall not live by bread alone. See, bread and natural food certainly keeps our physical being going. But to, to keep, for, keep our spiritual being going, we've got to have food daily. Spiritual food. Meditate on it, point number four. Meditate in it day and night. How do I get the word from my mind into my heart? Meditation, as we look at it again and we begin to pick it up, we begin to memorize the scripture and repeat it over and over and over. We visualize it, we murmur it, we mutter it, we confess the word. Same word, same verse, say it again. Say it once more. I've already said it three times. Say it again. Keep on saying it. Keep on saying it. You know when it enters into your heart because when it's there, it's like suddenly you're excited about it. While you're struggling to confess the word, it's clearly not in your heart. But when it is in your heart, wow, it is exciting. And now it's entered. The entrance of God's word brings light. See, God says to Joshua, in order for him to be successful and, 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 and all of that, he says... The book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate in it or on it day and night that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it, for then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. The Word of God is in its own right the success formula of life. And in order to be successful in everything we do, successful in family life, successful in marriage, successful in in business, successful in the job, successful in the education, successful even in sports. The Word of God helps us to operate at peak performance in every area of our lives. And finally, number five, do what it says. James 1.25, But the truly happy people are those who carefully study God's perfect law that makes people free, and they continue to study it. So in other words, they studied it and they're still studying it. He says, they do not forget what they heard, but they obey what God's teaching says. Those who do so will be made happy. Um, and so in other words, God's word is not fully operational in, in my life until I'm actually doing it. So hear the word, confess the word, meditate on it, receive it, embrace it, speak it. And then do it, and then the package is complete, and suddenly things begin to happen, and fruitfulness begins to happen. And it all goes back to the seeds of God's Word. Um, and uh, that's about all I'm going to say today. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Wonderful Jesus. Wonderful Jesus. We're so grateful, Lord, for the Word. We're so grateful for truth. We don't know that we're in error until we hear truth. That, Lord, your Word declares that all Scripture, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction and for instruction in righteousness, that the men of God may be thoroughly furnished and thoroughly equipped. And Lord, we make a decision right now to receive the word. We reject every mindset, every concept, every, every, 
every lie, every bit of deception, every cultural norm that is contrary to your word. And we embrace your word. We keep it. And with patience, we bring forth fruit. Father, I want to thank you, for Lord, for my brothers and sisters, Lord, as we have submitted ourselves to the preaching of the word. We thank you, Father, that great understanding has come. Lord, I pray for every man, I pray for every woman in this place. But Lord, if there's any hindrance that hinders the verb from producing, that Lord, you point that out and give people the grace to lay it down and to repent of it and to reject that area out of their lives. For Lord, we want to be productive people. We want to grow. We want to advance spiritually. That's what we want to do. And we thank you, Father, that even we ourselves are fruit of your word. When we got saved, Lord, that was the fruit of somebody else sowing seeds of salvation into our lives. And Lord, as we go forth today, we thank you, Father, that you have empowered us to sow seeds of salvation. To, Lord, to minister the gospel to, in one-on-one, -on -one, verbally, through tracts and books and CDs and, and, and uh, various uh, publications so that there can be a harvest of souls in other people's lives. And Lord, as we truly fulfill that mission that you have for us, that we are reaching people for God, and, and Lord, as we are helping them to become fully devoted followers of Christ, I thank you, Lord God, that there's less tragedy going on in society, less calamity, less sickness, less disease, less poverty, less marriage breakup, that people are living successful lives. In Jesus' name, amen.